his poem, A Worker Reads History, Bertolt Brecht exclaimed, each page a victory, at whose expense the victory ball? Every 10 years, a great man, who paid the piper? So many particulars, so many questions. We welcome to Grit TV one of the world's great writers, an author who has tackled those questions and provided us with poignant particulars. His latest book, Mirrors, Stories of Almost Everyone, puts flesh on the bones of hundreds of half-told histories, from the invasion of the Americas to the invasion of Iraq and the birth of beer. Eduardo Galeano made headlines in April when Venezuela's President Chavez gave President Obama a copy of his book, Open Veins of Latin America, at the Summit of the Americas. But here, on a very rare visit to the United States, Galeano's been making it pretty clear that making history doesn't interest him half as much as uncovering it and helping us all to imagine more. He is the recipient of many international prizes, including the first Lannan Prize for Cultural Freedom, the American Book Award, and the Casa de las Americas Prize. We're ever so glad he's taken the time to come to GRIT TV. Laura, it's my pleasure. It's my joy to have you here. Your book begins this way. Mirrors are filled with people. The invisible see us. The forgotten recall us. When we see ourselves, we see them. When we turn away, do they? Do you answer that question in this book? The book is written to answer, because I, I feel I'm, I'm full of people. As you are, everybody is full of people. Nobody's really alone. So when you look in we the mirror. We have a crowd inside. <laughs> <laughs> when you look in the mirror, who do you see? Oh, so many people, especially the invisible. And I'm trying to write to recover them because I'm trying to help rebuilding, re-revealing the terrestrial rainbow, this beautiful, beautiful rainbow of human condition with so many colors. And we are blind of these colors because of the mutilations done by, by racism and machismo and militarism and elitism, and I don't know how many isms. All the isms. isms. Yeah. You write that impunity is the daughter of oblivion. How, yes. how so? It's the daughter of oblivion, yes, yes. We are obliged to, to amnesia, to accept amnesia as a normal way of life in the modern world. And this is part, I think, of this, perhaps some, some sort of dictatorship of fear, so we, we are afraid of remembering as we are afraid of living, thinking, feeling. Afraid why? Because we afraid might have to do something? Afraid because the owners of power are the owners also of a big factory of fear. The world is a big factory of fear. So you, you're afraid of losing your job or not, not finding a job or losing your house or losing your, I don't know, losing perhaps, uh, for instance, your job is you speak too much or you really say what you think. And so you become fear of words, afraid of words and afraid of memory and afraid of everything and especially afraid of the other one, your neighbor. Your neighbor is not a promise, it's a menace. He may kill you or, or rob you or, or, I don't know, violate. Maybe get better or... than you. One of our <laughs> big obsessions here is status in relation to other people and ranking things. Ah, yes. In this country, you may have heard we had an election last year and we had a very crazy primary season with a woman candidate and an African-American candidate and many other candidates. And people got into ranking which oppression is worst. Gender oppression, race oppression. Yes. You, you talk about gender a lot in this book. Do you think it's worst? No oppression is worst or better than other oppression. But there are so many oppressions, it's true that uh, Half of humanity, you women, who are called a minority, I don't know why or how, but this is one of the mysteries of 
the modern dictionary, have, has been and still are oppressed indeed. Uh, but the situation has improved. But anyway, it, I, I told here in Mirror several stories. Read one. About I want you to read one. The Origin of Beauty, page ah. three. Ah, okay. Uh, yeah, you can take off the tag. There you ah. go. Speaking about this sort of oppression, yes. There they are, painted on the walls and ceiling, or caves, bison, elk, birds, horses, seagulls, women, men. These figures are ageless. They were born thousands upon thousands of years ago, but they are born anew every time someone looks at them. How could our ancestor of long ago paint so delicately? How could a brute who fought wild beasts with his bare hands create images so filled with grace? How did he manage to draw those flying lines that break free of the stone and take to the earth? How could he? How, how could he? Or was it she? <laughs> or was it she? <laughs> Eduardo Galeano. <laughs> this is one of the stories. There are a lot of stories about women. Women, also race. Yes. Another story from this country right now. We have a, a new nominee for the Supreme Court. Yes. I, I Sonia Sotomayor. Sonia, yes. And she has talked about what she brings to the bench. And among the things she brings, she says, is her experience as a Latina woman. Yes. Elsewhere, she has said in speeches that a Latina mother has experience that would enable her to make uh, decisions better than a white man without that experience. And she's getting grief for making this comment. She I now know, is know. called I racist. Yes, yes. What do you make of that? <laughs> it seems to be a joke, no? Calling Calling racist uh, a man like, like so a woman like Sonia, <laughs> that's the way it is. Uh, it makes no sense at all. It does seem that when people who are the invisible gain a voice, yes, they're too loud. Yes, it, that's uh, not well seen because the the owners of truth and of everything else doesn't want to be invaded by by others. And uh, this world is, goes on being quite, quite machista and, and racist also. No? Even, I, I think, for instance, the fact that, that the United States have now a black or half black, black president is, is very good news in the long fight against racism. But racism is still alive and, and going on, and it will take a long, long time to, to win this never-ending war against discrimination. You can see it in the news, for instance, in the newspapers, uh, about, about Iraq war, for instance. We know exactly, exactly how many invaders were killed in the war, in Iraq war, exactly the number. But we have no ideas about the invaded killed. There are so many figures, absolutely different, di diverse, thousands. We only know that there are thousands and thousands and thousands of invaded killed in a war which was born from a lie and lying continues to exist. Mm. And, but we, this is racism. W in which sense? In the sense that, that in this world we have a still uh, women and men of first, second, third, fourth category, and also dead corpses mm -hmm. of first, second, third, fourth category. This is racism. To talk about another ism, you write about Alan Turing. Why? Yes. Because, uh, as I said yesterday, each time we turn on our computer, we should say thank you to Alan Turing, who was the father of the computer. He invented it. And he was uh, homosexual in England. 
1952, the police uh, take him as a prisoner in jail. At that time, homosexuality was at once a disease and a crime. And so the justice asked him about this crime of being homosexual and he admitted he was and he was obliged to accept a cure mm. because it was also a sickness mm. and the cure left him crazy I mean he he grew breasts and he lost his mind I mean. mm. and, and he, he was always feeling that somebody was around menacing him mm. or he he didn't went back to the university where he was a highly estimated and prestigious professor and alone and alone and alone and each day he has the habit of eating an apple before going to, to the bed to sleep and once he injected poison on the apple he was mm. going to eat. We'll never know what else he would have invented. Alan Turing. Yeah. Now, now gays are gay movements We're still have, fighting. have yes have <laughs> won have won a, 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 a broad space if you compare. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, some some things have improved in nope. the world, you know, indeed. We, but still, we have this. Sort well, let me ask you about that. Progress suggests movement forward. Some of your book, some of your books have a tone that is almost nostalgic, and you said it before about remaking a mutilated tapestry. But in history, ancient people, enslaved people, powerful Africans participated in the slave trade. Was there ever yes. a, a golden age? No, no, never. <laughs> of course, never. We are all half, half garbage and half marble. But all, is, all of us. As I humans, mean, are uh, we going forward or back? But you have to choose. I mean, to choose. Sorry, <laughs> you have to choose. And uh, knowing that, that reality is made from, human reality is made from mud, barro. But mud. do you think we're making it better or we're worse? In some, in some ways, better, indeed. In other ways, not. For instance, in this um, subject of uh, sexual diversity, I think, Nowadays, the world is becoming to change, uh -huh. but uh, still homosexuality is uh, a crime in, a, in uh -huh. something like 80 or 90 countries. So it, we are still far away from a real world able to recognize in its own diversity the best of its richness, because the best the world has Inside is so many words inside. Read one more. America. America. Uh, Let me see. About Amer the beginning Americans. of Americans. Ah. About the beginnings of this country. Yes. The, <laughs> I'm going to tell the story of the first sentence because <laughs> if, before reading it, when I was a child, eight, eight or nine years old, <clears throat> in, in my classroom, uh, the teacher, I, I had not a good relationship with the teacher because I had a uh, maniac obsession asking questions. And, and at that time, this was not very a very good sign of you know, good health. It implied <laughs> that you have some madness inside or That's right. a, a trend to be a rebel or to be a... And so, she was always looking at me in a not more, not very friendly way. <laughs> and once she said in the classroom that Vasco Núñez de Balboa, who was a Spanish conqueror, had been the first man, the first man who saw both oceans at once. And from a summit in Panama, he saw both seas, both oceans at once. Did your hand go up? <laughs> senorita, senorita, what? 
¿Were the natives blind? Fuera. <laughs> Fuera. I was expelled from the classroom, as usual. Later, I was expelled from several other places, countries, and so on. But this was my, my first experience. So you are a good model to people being <laughs> expelled everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, that's why this, this, this story begins saying that official history has it that Vasco Núñez de Balboa was the first man to see from a summit in Panama two oceans at once. Were the natives, natives blind? Who first gave names to corn and potatoes and tomatoes and chocolate and the mountains and rivers of America? Hernán Cortés, Francisco Pizarro. Were the natives mute? The pilgrims on the Mayflower heard him, God. God said America was a promised land. Were the natives deaf? Later on, the grandchildren of the pilgrims size, seized, seized the name and seized every single. And now they are the Americans, you. <laughs> <laughs> and those of us who live in the other Americas, who are we? I remember, <laughs> I, remember I, I was in Stanford some years ago as a professor in Stanford. And uh, we, we, we had a, a very, very nice man taking us in the bus because it's, it's a big university and back home. And, and I was always talking to him and he, he came from Guatemala. And once he said, when I, when I, I first came here, to America, and I, and I asked him, but where did you come from? From Guatemala. <laughs> from Guatemala? Where is Guatemala? <laughs> <laughs> he, he, couldn't, he couldn't imagine that Guatemala was America also, and that Guatemala had been America years and years before the pilgrims arrived to the coast here in, in Plymouth. It comes to a question about um, the world. We uh, have a notion right now of globalization that some people confused with internationalism. Yes. What's the difference? Well, globalization is clearly the, the internationalism of money. And internationalism means that, uh, well, M Mirrors is an internationalist book. My intention was to show that frontiers, boundaries, may be erased, boundaries in the map, boundaries in, in time, and that we may, all of us, all of us become contemporaries and compatriots of anyone, mm. anyone, man or woman, born in very distant places or in very distant times. This is internationalism. Mm. The, the, the conviction, the faith on the fact that we, we all form part of the same human condition and we share fears, hopes, feelings, thoughts, memories. This is internationalism. The promise of the neighbors, not the menace. Yeah, you the before. neighbor seen as a promise, not as a menace. Read one more, criminology. It's there criminology. Uh, towards Let me see. the uh, end there. 344 criminology. Our solution typically to people we're scared of is just to do away with them. If I if I commit some mistakes, pronunciation in English, sorry, but there'll be a heavy fine. Every year, chemical pesticides kill no fewer than three million farmers. Every day, workplace accidents kill no fewer than 10,000 workers. Every minute, poverty kills no fewer than 10 children. The last figure published by the United Nations is 15 children, not 10. So this should be corrected. <laughs> Every minute, poverty kills no fewer than 15 children. These crimes do not show up on the news. They are, like wars, normal acts of cannibalism. 
The criminals are on the loose. No prisons are built for those who rip the guts out of thousands and thousands. Prisons are built as public housing for the poor. More than two centuries ago, Thomas Paine wondered, why is it that scarcely any are executed but the poor? Texas, 21st century. The Last Supper sheds light on the cell blocks clientela, clientel, 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 clientel. Nobody chooses lobster or filet mignon, even though those, those dishes figure on the farewell menu. The condemned men prefer to say goodbye to the world with the usual burgers and fries. Mm. Our Rundati Roy talks about another future, another world being possible. She says she's not only possible, she's coming on a quiet day. I can hear her breathing. Yes. Clearly you can hear her breathing. Yes. Where do you hear her? You know, for instance, this, this sentence about how many children are killed by poverty. Fifteen each minute, fifteen, uh, killed by hunger or, or curable diseases. Well, also, each minute, each minute, the world spend, each minute, three million dollars in military um, and military budgets and military industry three million dollars is that going to change on october 2 this is a free advertising i'm doing for a movement i take part in, in this movement we are organizing for october 2 a big immense zion manifestation for the for peace against violence and i hope we it will be done everywhere in all countries and i hope millions and millions and millions of feet will be there walking to say walk, walking maybe a way to say a language also to say we are, we are not doomed to accept this uh, fate of human fate of being the only the only animals the only an, uh, only animals specialized in in the mutual extermination we are not doomed to it we may we may build a different world it's also possible not only possible to accept it you can do something against it where do you see that happening everywhere everywhere there, there is always this energy of change you know, I, I, I know that uh, there are so many beautiful stories along the, along the long history, human history, that had no happy ends. It's true. But history herself, this stubborn lady, she doesn't end. She goes on. She goes on walking. So where do you see it right now? Is it Uruguay, with its struggle around impunity? Is it Bolivia, the first uh, indigenous president? Is it Hugo Chavez? Is it right here with the movements of people for change here? Everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. Looking to recover, trying to recover common sense. And it's, it's uh, the, we, we have the habit of the, uh, accepting uh, madness as a, as a normal way of life. For instance, when President Correa, you, you mentioned Ecuador, President Correa, Correa says, uh, yes, we are going to pay foreign debt, but only the legitimate debt. <laughs> only the legitimate debt. We are not going to pay the, the debt coming from the generous loans given by the international credit organizations and the big banks to the military dictatorships, 
or to the corrupted politicians, this we are not going to pay. It's an act of common sense. We may adopt that same act in the United States with the banks and the credit card charges. Yes, yes. I want you to close by reading one last piece. It's the very, very end, Lost and Found. Ah, <laughs> Lost and Found, yes. Yes. It's about something I believed when I was a child, yes. The 20th century, which was born proclaiming peace and justice, died bathed in blood. It passed on a world much more unjust than the one it inherited. The 21st century, which also arrived heralding peace and justice, is following in its predecessor's footsteps. In my childhood, I was convinced that everything that went astray on Earth ended up on the Moon. But the astronauts found no sign, no sign at all, of dangerous dreams, or broken promises, or hopes betrayed. If not on the moon, where might they be? Perhaps they were never misplaced. Perhaps they are in hiding here, here on Earth, waiting, esperando, esperando nos. Waiting for us. Eduardo Galeano's new book is Mirrors, Stories of Almost Everyone. It is out now from Nation Books. Thank you so much for coming to Grid TV. Thank you, Lola.